ladies and gentlemen, please give a really warm welcome to Dirk Campbell. Hello, nice to be back again. Um, I'll talk for some, something around 45, 50 minutes and uh, leave a bit of time at the end for questions because I, I do notice that people have questions when I've spoken uh, before and uh, so I'll give you a chance to do that. Um, <clears throat> my talk is about the evidence for dance and music from the Paleolithic to the first civilizations by way of the theory based on archaeological evidence that our musicality helps to explain our global dominance. First of all, we could ask the question, why are we humans musical at all? What does music mean apart from our experience of it? Why do we enjoy creating sound sequences along with the body movements which we call dance? And why do we do it in groups? No other animal does this, including the other members of the hominidae family to which we belong. A <clears throat> Perhaps only we Cro-Magnons have ever done it. If we are the only musical sapiens or the most musical, it may have something to do with why we've taken over the planet. 100,000 years ago, humans were not the most powerful beings on Earth, it goes without saying. Other animals were far more powerful. Humans had to use all their ingenuity just to survive. Over time, the conventional thinking goes, their comparative physical weakness caused them to compensate by evolving superior intelligence. The fact that this didn't also happen to naked mole rats would be due to different environmental factors. Anyway, we developed this superior brain power and began our rise to global domination around 12,000 years ago, following the last ice age. Now, brain power alone could not be responsible for mankind's success as a species. Other animals, including those with larger brains than us, process information just as we do, learn just as we do, observe obligations and morals, even cheat and deceive just as we do. Our success can't be ascribed solely to our organizational ability either. Bees and ants are much better organized than we are. The world historian Yuval Noah Harari has theorized that our unique ability to cooperate flexibly in large numbers is what got us where we are today. Social insects cooperate in large numbers, but inflexibly. Bees only do things one way, and if that doesn't work, they're stuffed. Starlings appear to be cooperating in large numbers to create their extraordinary improvised patterns in the sky, but as Dawkins has shown, really, it's just individual birds obeying simple local rules. The patterns aren't conscious, and there is no group mind. Elephants cooperate flexibly, but only with a small number of other elephants that they know well. Humans, like our chimpanzee cousins, can't know more than around 100 individuals well. And while chimps regard all stranger chimps with hostility, our ability to cooperate flexibly with people we don't know, forming much larger groups, is the reason we gained dominance and chimps didn't. <coughs> Sorry, whenever I call for a breed, it goes into this microphone. I don't know how to do anything about that. Um, like, like that? Okay. Harari says that organized religion and centralized authority come about when large groups of humans work together on horticulture, farming, and massive building projects, like Gobekli Tepe, pyramids, um, and Stonehenge. But there is a missing link here. For political hierarchies and cohesive belief systems to arise at all, there have to be enough people already able to cooperate flexibly in large numbers for these epiphenomena to occur. Harari seems to think that such cooperation happens spontaneously, but of course, nothing does that. There has to be a catalyst. This is where we're moving on to my central thesis. An enabling factor somewhere. Something has to get us from the small band of a hundred consisting of people that know and trust each other to the larger group of a thousand or more without the small bands fighting each other and the whole project falling apart before it has even started. Or there would have to have been a king, an authority figure to pull all the bands together. Um, as um, Steiner theorized in the last talk, 
But hunter-gatherer bands would have had no concept of a king, nor any interest in an overall authority figure. It is, of course, important to mention that of all the hundreds of sapiens cultures, only one has risen to total prominence, the one most of us here belong to. <clears throat> I'll start by trying to play this bone flute, really tricky embouchure. Bone flutes have been found, this is equidistant hole spacing on a piece of bone with a notched embouchure to make the sound. <coughs> As you can see in the top left, bone flutes have been found that date back 36,000 years. They are the earliest human artifacts discovered that are not purely functional and they are musical instruments. Current academic thinking based on this evidence is that it was music which enabled small bands of Cro-Magnons to form larger groups and cooperate more successfully than other Sapiens groups. But with flutes, <laughs> these things are pretty quiet. They don't, the sound doesn't carry far, certainly not in the open air where a large group would have to gather. No, it would have to have been drums and voices that did that job. And as we will see in a few minutes, it is voices and drums that still accompany the dancing of pre-modern societies. Nothing survives from the Paleolithic except bone and stone, certainly not skin and wood. The earliest drums we have then are some pottery goblet drums from the Neolithic. Not the skins, of course, those have been added on recently. Now, if anybody's familiar, and I'm sure you all are, <coughs> with this Middle Eastern drum, it's the same. <laughs> same idea that you have a central column which gives a bass note and the edge giving you the alternating sound. And this was found in Germany. So <coughs> it gives you an idea of the kind of spread of Neolithic culture across uh, Europe and the Near East. Some cultures don't use drums. Stick clicking, rattles, hand clapping, and singing provide rhythmic impetus just as well. The object on the left has been identified as possibly a bull roarer based on its shape and the hole at the top. This is a bull roarer. If I can get it to go around. That's being a bit intransigent. <laughs> Worked fine at home. There we are. Again, a very quiet sound. <coughs> um, one of the interesting things about the, the bull roarer, supposed bull roarer, is um, the regular lines and right angles that have been carved on it. Like the lines on the figurine and the bracelet from the same period, these are abstract patterns that don't represent anything in nature and don't have any meaning apart from their aesthetic appeal. Paleolithic artists were masters of figurative art as, their, as the cave paintings at Lascaux and other and elsewhere demonstrate, but all their non-figurative decoration features regular repetition, lines, zigzags, lozenges, rings, dots, and spirals, designs whose counterpart in sound is regular rhythm. Now, you may object that re regular rhythmic sounds and movements are not exclusive to humans. They're produced by a bird flying or a horse galloping, or you may point out that a beehive contains regular hexagons, but these shapes and rhythms are strictly functional. 
A horse, a bird, or a bee does not respond to regular rhythm the way humans do, though some animals can be trained to appear to do so. Bees dance, but not in synchronized groups. <laughs> um, sw synchronized swimming. Birds produce melody, but not in unison. Every mammal has experienced the regular rhythm of its mother's heartbeat in utero, but it is only humans that deliberately make regular rhythms in synchronization and that make musical sounds in unison. Every blackbird and every whale has its own song, which we can distinguish as its species song, but they don't sing in unison with each other. The first Cro-Magnons were physically and intellectually identical to us, except that their brains were a little bigger than ours. Modern technology has not come about because of increased brain processing power. It has come about because we are capable, as you will recall, of cooperating in ways that no other animal is. So, why did technological progress not happen earlier? Many reasons to do with environment, population density, and so on. Once the right factors are in place, any evolutionary pro uh, process is exponential. It traces an increasing upward trajectory <coughs> with most of the curve below the median. So growth seems to happen suddenly. An unhindered exponential curve only stops when it reaches the limit for its environment, then goes into a sudden decline like an aeroplane stalling. This is what happened to civilizations when they overextend themselves, like the Romans, the Maya, the Rapa Nui, Great Zimbabwe, and many others. Our love of melody and rhythm is evident from earliest childhood. All humans make music and dance together and have done so for at least as long as we have been scratching figures on rocks. <coughs> so this is from China. The Paleolithic rock art, um, you can see that all the figures are holding the same objects and presumably making the same movements. Neolithic, um, there's these strange curly shapes, but again, all doing the same thing. So they could be seen to be dancing. And in the classical period, the vase art, early classical period, all the dancers, again, gesturing similarly, but they're not um, in close contact. The Paleolithic in Africa, I don't know if you can see very well um, on the top is a uh, cave painting from Namibia. That's the, the Khoisan there. South Africa, again, Khoisan. They, they appear to be dancing with sticks or spears, um, again, in a, some kind of uh, ritualized way, or not ritualized, but you know, formalized way. And then in the Sahara, You've again got these, these figures performing movements um, similarly, but again, not in contact with each other. So to get to the point where we have shoulder holds or hand holds, this is quite widespread. It's in India, south, southern India, Tamil Nadu, Arabia, that's the low left, and the southern USA, the Anasazi. Um, nowadays known as the Pueblo. Um, so look at this. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, 3,000 years ago in Greece and 4,000 years ago in Crete, they are performing dances almost exactly the same as the Maya and the Kolima from 2,000 years ago. And I, I would say that the, the style of the pottery is so close that it's, um, well, it, it's, it's just extraordinary. <laughs> um, would lend support to some kind of connection between those two worlds. Um, by the time of the Fertile Crescent civilizations, music had developed to suit indoor performance, and this is largely what the iconography of ancient Egypt shows. There is nowhere any depiction of sound vibration, for those of you who are interested in this subject, being used to raise a 100-ton block of stone. 
There are stories of such things everywhere, but no representations of what I would have thought were spectacular events well worth depicting. And I do have a few thoughts about that, which I'll come to later, keeping you tantalized there. On the other hand, we do have living music and dance traditions going back millennia and some very old images and instruments which correspond with them. The Egyptian ney, for example, is still played throughout the Middle East and North Africa, as shown in the top left group. This is an Egyptian ney. See the pot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you see the posture with the instrument held out to one side. They're playing it left handed, I think. But anyway, it's the same. Uh, the transverse flute was not used as a transverse flute. Um, unknown to the ancient Egyptians and is not used today in areas where the ney is played. So this is a transverse flute. Sorry, I'm trying to sort out the microphone arrangement here. <laughs> That's not going to work. Chinese pizza. Um, this is a West African tambin, also a transverse loop. <laughs> That's where the so-called shagadelic flute style <laughs> comes from. You know, um, in the 80s, when there was all that kind of very chiffy flute playing and, um, on um, uh, pop records. But how can we know what music sounded like in remote antiquity? We know what the instruments sounded like in most cases because we still have them. We don't know what their melodies were, but I can hazard a guess as to their tuning. The whole spacing of their pipes hasn't changed, so the tuning of their stringed instruments must have conformed as they are depicted in performance together. Here is a reconstructed Egyptian double pipe that you can see being played in the top right-hand corner of the slide. Oh, that's the wrong box. Hope it's in tune. <laughs> Not quite.
Um, thank you. Nine thousand year old flutes recently found in China have the same equidistant hole spacing as folk flutes made in China today. This is a pai di made out of cane, and it would essentially play the same scale as that end blown flute there. I'll just play the scale so you can hear. Now that sounds very similar to our own major scale, but if you listen carefully, you'll hear that the, flat, uh, the, the third is very flat and the fourth is very sharp. Flat third. Very sharp fourth. That's a very flat seventh as well. That's roughly right. So, although it sounds familiar to us, actually it's not quite accurate, but that's what you get when you divide the octave up into seven equal divisions. Now, why equidistant hole spacing? Without going into too much technicality, the pitch system produced by equal hole spacing does not correspond exactly to any natural pitch system, such as the overtone series, which I will demonstrate later. I suppose it's a function of early human fascination with regularity, that perfection for them lay in equal arrangement. The resulting pitches would be accepted as musical. On the ne, if you take out the two holes that were added to accommodate other, sco other scales, you see... I'm Work out which they are. Yeah, you see equal hole spacing. So, um, uh, I've lost my place. It's the same scale as you just heard on the Pi D. It's a roughly major scale. On the midgewiz, which is a double pipe, you see the same equal hole spacing, still played across the Middle East and North Africa. Um, in ancient times, uh, the, the, the pipes were separate, played separately, as I demonstrated earlier. Nowadays, they're bound together so that each pair of holes can be covered with one finger. Midgewiz. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you don't have to applaud each time. Um, no. no, I've got to find my argul. It's knocking around here somewhere. Oh yeah. This is an argul, um, which is another form of double pipe, uh, single chanter with a drone. three instruments are from Egypt. Um, I feel the need to draw attention, and now is probably as good a time as any. Um, oh, that's just a slide uh, demonstrating the difference between equal uh, heptatonic division and the modern major scale, just roughly similar. Um, uh, <laughs> you got the joke. Um, now it seems as good a time as any to the fact that what we call musical harmony probably goes back only a few hundred years. 
Polyphony is a late medieval European invention. Chordal accompaniments more recent still, about 200 years. The tonic dominant harmonization so popular in African music today is an import from Europe. In the olden days, musical sophistication consisted in the decoration and embellishment of the melody, as it still does today in, in non-Western-influenced tradition. For most of human history, music was either monophonic, meaning a single melody alone, or heterophonic, meaning simultaneous varying versions of a single melody. At the end of this presentation, I will play two clips of traditional heterophony. Now, the following film clips are of survivals of dance from pre-modern societies, Inuit, Samburu, Ainu, Huli, Yatmul, Apache, and Kayapo. Uh, I won't play the full clips um, because of time constraints. And afterwards, I'll show instruments and depictions from prehistoric times to the classical civilizations of Egypt, Greece, and Rome, which you've already seen some, but I'll show you some more. Thank you. This is the, the Gyoa Haven drum dance from the Western Arctic, Kukluktuk Inuit Nation. What's interesting about that, um, and a lot of uh, Native American um, drumming to song, is that the beat is on the offbeat. As you notice, I'll have to play it to you again, but take my word for it. Their steps were on the beat, and they were, they were beating on the offbeat. So it was like... And that very strong backbeat seems to me to have influenced American popular music, because um, that's where you hear it most uh, in a most pronounced way. But it, it, dates, it goes back to Native American um, music. OK, this is the Samburu uh, from northern Kenya. <laughs> Dance is a very simple stop, uh, hop step. Oh. Right, this is the, the Ainu traditional dance from Hokkaido. The Ainu are the, the, the proto Japanese, they were there before the, the Japanese invaded from Korea about 300 BC. Uh, 
Again, you notice um, with the Ainu dance that the dancers were separate, not linked as they are um, in uh, northern Kenya. And um, the, the, the northern USA dancers, again, were separate. So we're looking at a very old form of dance in those uh, parts of remote antiquity where dancers danced individually. This is the, um, the, the Huli wig men from Papua New Guinea. They play possum skin drums, and they dance in an imitation of the bird of paradise. So, excuse the American voice, voiceover, it's from a documentary. They're using goblet drums. sing, and their singing is unforgettable. Papua New Guinea is a very interesting place. Um, there, it's a repository of a, a tremendous variety of musical styles uh, and instruments. And in fact, I think in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, there are 400 distinct languages spoken, uh, which, are, uh, which represent all the different languages of the world in many ways. You know, there are tonal languages like the Chinese, there are um, languages which are agglutinative, like Turkish, and uh, amazing place, Papua New Guinea. Uh, this is another Papua New Guinea indoor dance where they're using overtone flutes. Overtone flutes are particularly interesting. Um, I've got some which I'll demonstrate later. Uh, and I do like that clip. <laughs> uh, this is the, the White Mountain Apache crown dance. <laughs> Goes on like that. And finally, the Kayapo. Uh, 
I have to move on. You'll notice they're using a shoulder hold and uh, a, da a dance step which any of you that have done circle dance will be very familiar with. It's the grapevine. So uh, more Middle Eastern or Near Eastern influences there. Um, now, mouth bow. This is reckoned to be one of the oldest instruments. See if I can get it. I don't know if you could hear the overtones there. Yep. Um, and this is supposed to be the oldest depiction of a Neolithic shaman, or Paleolithic rather. But um, if you look at where he is, the red arrow, you see he's in the middle of a herd of aurochs. And if you turn him 90 degrees sideways, you'll see he's actually just crawling into the middle, covered in an, uh, an auroch skin with his bow held in his mouth so as to get up and shoot them. It's not, it's not a shaman at all. But it was a nice idea. Some of you may have heard of the Pyramid City of Corral, the oldest city in America, 5,000 years old, recently discovered on the coastal plain of Peru. Small pelican bone flutes were discovered in the ruins. And it sounded like this. oldest wooden instruments yet discovered were found in County Wicklow, Ireland. It's not understood how they were played. There are no finger holes. And, but they do have the chamfered ends, which remind me rather of this Turkish instrument, which actually has finger holes, but I've taken them up uh, so as to make it into an overtone flute. <laughs> Um, here's one from Kenya. Uh, sorry, not Kenya. What am I talking about? Tanzania. The Wagogo tribe of Tanzania play this. speed up a bit. Um, overtone flutes are used in many countries of Europe and Scandinavia, and Scandinavia using the overtone series as a pitch, pitch system, just like the mouth bow. Uh, overtone series used in the vocal music of the Ituri Pygmies, the Wagogo of Tanzania, Papua New Guinea, and in the overtone singing technique of Siberia and Mongolia. Mm -hmm. common factor with all those is that they're all using the overtone series as a pitch system so that the, the notes of the overtone series become the notes of the tune. Animal horns are used as trumpets everywhere. Um, they go back thousands of years, everywhere from Africa to Scandinavia. The side hole was preferred in ancient Ireland just as, as it is in Africa today. Um, now, here is my tangent on possible megalithic technology that I flagged up before. Acoustic amplification consists of creating uh, a, a vibrating, uh, bringing a vibrating sound source into contact with a, a column of air, uh, for example, like this. 
So I'm using the column of air uh, as the fundamental. But it's not very loud. If I um, connect it to a, a larger cylinder, say this large piece of bamboo, um, it's a bit louder because the volume of air is wider, but it's still not very loud. But if you connect it to a cone of air, cone-shaped air, you go, which is about 20 times louder than, than the original sound source, I would say. Um, so what you've got there is free energy simply by altering the shape of the vibrating object or vibrating air column. Um, I saw a talk uh, recently about somebody kept going on about cone-shaped tools. Um, Eric von Daniken, I think it was. He didn't understand what these cone-shaped tools were. So if any of you have Eric, Eric von Daniken's number, give him a call. Suggest that's my theory. Um, now, metal trumpets. Um, going back to Greece and Egypt. Oh, um, that was their cow horns. Here are the metal trumpets. That's what those carnics uh, from the Gundestrup cauldron on the right would have sounded like, except they were curved, so they were up in the air. Um, these are double pipes, uh, like I was playing earlier, from the Eastern Mediterranean. From the Western Mediterranean, they seem to be associated with what's called ithyphallic uh, erect penises. Um, and uh, nowadays, they're played in Baluchistan, uh, Sardinia. This is an example of the Baluch double pipe. It's called a Donali, small one. This is Ney, Ancient and Modern, um, same as I played earlier. This is a, this is, um, a pan pipe in antiquity. You all heard of pan pipe. Um, but the, the pan pipes are very widespread. It's probably the most widespread of all the uh, early flutes that still survives around the world. It's not played in ancient Egypt at all. Um, these are clay flutes, fipple flutes, from uh, Central America, the ocarina, uh, which you've all heard, I'm sure. Make sure I've got my fingers in the right holes. Ocarina sound. And this is a type of ocarina which is found in the Amazon, uh, among certain Amazon tribes, which is uh, a nose flute. If I get it round the right way. Um, so it sounds a bit like the, the clangers. You know. Oh, and... Um, the trumpets, where are we? The ceremonial trumpets played by the Maya. Um, pretty similar to um, Tibetan ceremonial trumpets. Interesting connection there. Uh, these are bow lyres, ancient and modern, played in ancient Egypt and East Africa. I should say that uh, musical instruments were played by women as much as they were by men. 
and women tended to specialize in the plucked instruments, not the harps. They, they, they played lyres and double pipes, whereas the men played harps and um, uh, nays, flutes. So you, you'll there see a woman playing this lute, which now survives in West Africa. It's called Ngoni. The, um, the Nyatiti is uh, played, played in East Africa. I'm having to zip through these. Musicians in ancient Egypt were female as much as male. I already said that. Ngoni Nyantiti. The, the army musicians on the far right, guys playing what is nowadays called a sorna. It's very loud. Um, Again, this conical um, exponential curve on the inside of the instrument changes <coughs> to what you heard. <laughs> Amazing invention of natural amplification. This is dance in ancient Egypt. Um, Egyptian women dancing and drumming. The Berbers today are the inheritors. You can see the, the way the women are clapping in lines like this, using, uh, playing with the, their hands in parallel rather than the way we clap now. And again, lines of men accompanying a male instrumentalist. Um, now, this is uh, a very old survival from a tomb near the Great Pyramid. Um, I'll pass around some of these because you might be interested. Um, I made sort of specimen versions of these. Basically, Sir J. Gardner Wilkinson, in his book, The Ancient Egyptians, published in 1830, said, um, to, uh, dated around 5,000 years, a uh, half years ago, with. Uh, two of these pipes are in the British Museum. One of them was found with a piece of thick reed or straw inserted to the hollow of the pipe, the upper end so compressed as to leave a very small aperture for the admission of the breath. Um, this is the world's oldest known double reed instrument. The modern descendant is the instrument known in Armenia as Tsiranapog, uh, also called duduk. That's a picture of me playing a duduk. But this is the whatever those uh, hieroglyphs, wh whatever the vowels were between the consonants, the M, M, Sh, T, M, M, Sh, T, so it was probably Mamushet or Mamushet or something like that. Who knows? But that's uh, <laughs> that's pretty much what the duduk sounds like. Um, now, global distributions of instruments. I, 
I could have done global uh, distribution of lyres, um, percussion, and so on. But um, flutes are um, uh, the most diverse. So that's pan pipes, which I was mentioning. That's fipple flutes, which are um, a, like, like the Donali. Um, this is a fipple flute. Um, uh, transverse flutes, like the, the Deedza that I played at the beginning. Uh, ocarina. So you, a lot of these, it's interesting you see where, how Papua New Guinea is included in isolation. Um, the ocarina that occurs there, and also the oblique end-blown flute, which is the same as the ne um, fr from ancient Egypt, and you also find it in Tanzania, but also in Papua New Guinea. Um, vertical end-blown flute, um, which is uh, no, it's called a cana in the Andes. Um, this is a chap playing heterophonically on the Sardinian Launedas. In other words, he's playing two different versions of the same tune at the same time. It's quite amazing. Un'esibizione di Aurelio Porcu sulla Simponia e sull'Ispinello. And um, this is the Aturi Pygmies. Um, haven't got any film of them, but this is what they sound like. Heterophonic singing from the Congo. That, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my presentation. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Dirk Campbell. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was wonderful.